That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about The Humans, the directorial debut of Stephen Karam, based on his uh, Pulitzer finalist uh, and Tony Award winning play uh, from 2016, which I think won a Tony for best play that year. Uh, it premiered at the 2021 Toronto International Film Festival and A24 is very morbidly releasing it on Thanksgiving uh, this year. Oh, so we're a little late. Well, it's today. Today's the, Thanksgiving. Today's Thanksgiving. Oh. To be, so I have seen this once before, several weeks ago, and my immediate reaction was I wanted to like stick my head in the sand and not think about it. Um, it's not a fun watch. It's thought-provoking. It's thought-provoking. I think the story is excellent. It is. It's, it's kind of a horror comedy, if you will. And if you take your family to this on Thanksgiving, that's cruel. The so there's a lot I like about it. It's not a perfect film by any no, means. No, no, that's true. And I think the essence of the story is excellent. Uh, some of this dialogue and some of these characterizations didn't work for me. But the basic story is there's a family. It's modern day, uh, mom, dad, two adult daughters. One of the daughters, Bridget, played by Beanie Feldstein. She is hosting Thanksgiving this year. She lives in Chinatown in New York City. She lives in like a du like a multi-level duplex. The shit is raggedy as hell. She has just moved in with her newer boyfriend, Rich. And Played by Stephen Yoon. Okay. And their apartment's not ready. Their furniture hasn't arrived. Like, they don't even have light bulbs in every... Uh, <laughs> uh, in all the lighting fixtures. So it's not like a good place to host Thanksgiving. But here the family comes. So her other sister, Amy, played by Amy Schumer. Mm -hmm. Her two parents... Uh, Richard Jenkins is Eric, and uh, Deirdre is Jane Hudichel. And then Momo, who's like the grandma. Played by June Squibb. Who I think is Eric's mom. Yes. Okay. Momo is suffering from dementia. She requires a wheelchair. The opening scene is them trying to like wheel her into this apartment, which is not uh, easily accessible to someone in a wheelchair. But it's just them having Thanksgiving dinner, and... In a very familiar sort of model and story, the family sort of divulges secrets and issues that sort of push them apart, bring them together, and then it ends with everyone sort of leaving for the night. Okay. Amy is an attorney who works for a firm, and she shares right away that she's not being considered for partner, which essentially means she's going to be fired because she has a chronic medical condition, ulcerative colitis, which has caused her to miss quite a bit of work. So her firm wants to push her out. So that's her little trauma, along with, we see that she has, it, it seems recently broke up with a long-term ex and she's reeling over that. In addition to that, she shares towards the end that she has a more like serious acute medical concern. Like maybe she might have cancer. And have her part of her intestine removed. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Bridget, it, it seems like she's a gifted musician, but then she moved to New York and that never popped off. So it, uh, from my understanding, it seems like she is in like a dead end, like retail job, perhaps. Her boyfriend, who's meeting the family for the first time, he is studying to be a social worker, but we find out, he's 35 years old, and we find out that at the age of 40, he will receive a substantial inheritance from his grandmother. So this character sort of plays out like he hasn't really applied himself because he knows he'll, he'll be fine in the end. The mom, she has issues with weight. That's a topic that's brought up. She doesn't seem very happy. She works and she's sort of like a relic where she is. She mentions that there are people half her age making 10 times what she makes because she's not as technologically savvy. She doesn't seem happy. And then the dad, his big secret at the end of the film is he tells his children, because there's also a lot of talk about money, which we can get into, and like him building a vacation house, but he finally says there is no vacation house. And we actually had to sell our house because I lost my job. And therefore my pension most likely. Yeah. Because he works in a school and he had an inappropriate relationship with another faculty member, which is against their morality code. So not only was he fired, but his pension's in jeopardy. So they're in like dire straits. He's had to take a job at a Walmart 
far away so no one recognizes him so things aren't looking good and in the end because the parents are too drunk to drive um amy has to call a car for them to leave and that's it yeah if you are a fan of miserable white people at Thanksgiving films, such as Jodie Foster's Home for the Holidays or Ang Lee's The Ice Storm, this is this will satisfy your trilogy of those, I believe. Yeah. Um, it remind the writing is I mean it's it's very well written and performed. It reminded me of uh, Enric Ibsen, uh, but mostly Chekhov. This feels like a this feels very much like Chekhov, and I saw that I had read that Karam had staged The Cherry Orchard at one point, which is my favorite play by Chekhov, and I thought of that several times in this. Because that, I don't, you're not familiar with that. Um, that ends with this Russian family kind of, the sound of their beautiful, beloved cherry orchard being chopped down at the end is oh. the, the final moments of that play. There's a really good uh, Charlotte Rampling film version uh, from 1999 of that. But that, how the lake house and property uh, kind of plays into uh, this family's kind of ongoing disintegration. What works well for me, I think the apartment is a character in itself and it's very well shot. It's shot by Lowell Crawley who um, lends Brady Corbett's Vox Lux and Childhood of the Leader and oh. 45 years. Yeah, he's, he's excellent. Yeah, we really understand the claustrophobia and the drabness. Like it really sets a very effective mood. The opening sequences uh, as the credits run uh, are uh, the skyline from interior courtyard settings because that's what this apartment is in Chinatown and the this is an inward facing film in more ways than one uh, but I, I really like how that kind of establishes what the motifs are. I thought the mom and dad the performances along with the dialogue the characterizations were very well done I think those two characters felt very familiar. Jane Hudichel is so good and I think that's what it's a very unpleasant and uncomfortable film uh, in many ways that it, as you said, as we were watching, it's like being at a place you don't want to be is, is how it feels. So it's excellent in that regard. But she's, she, it, it reminded me of how I felt about watching what happens to the mom in Muriel's wedding. Like it's just to me that she's the ultimate victim here. Lastly, the, the story is so effective because I think it bred a lot of conversation afterwards. Mm -hmm. Like we talked for an hour about this film earlier today. So that really worked for me. What prevents me from giving this a very high score is the characterizations of Bridget and Rich. I thought they were so annoying. Rich is given, he's very one dimensional. He just kind of seems like, yeah, like he hasn't had to apply himself. He doesn't seem the most competent, but also is a little arrogant seeming like he knows what's best, even though he lives in this shitty apartment, trying to cook Thanksgiving dinner on some old stove with some one pot and like, but anyway, he has this, like this character trait where he keeps sharing the dreams he's been having, like four times. He, one, yes, he does seem like a throwaway character. And this is like Stephen Yoon's first uh, role after his Oscar nomination last year from Minari. Um, oh, okay. Which you didn't see. No. Uh, but yes, it just, it, it, I wish, I think that's where the film feels like there's a little wrinkle in it for me where he talks about, especially one dream in particular, about a grass, a baby made of grass and an ice cream cone. Because what it's doing is setting up Richard Jenkins' dream uh, about uh, a faceless woman and uh, being stuck in front of a tunnel. Because that is the closing moment of the film. Is, the, the tunnel representing his fear that he has to face and using faith he does so even though we kind of end up in a place that's just that that's covered in darkness we're not nothing is nothing has really innately been illuminated so i think that is powerful in itself i just wish that the conversations leading up to that about dreams had felt a little more um organic yeah next bridget there's so much I didn't like about this character. And she's not supposed to be like No, that. she's not. But I think her character is supposed to seem entitled. Because we find out, the, the, the way she talks to her uh, dad right away about like, because they're criticizing her apartment being shitty. And she's like, well, if you would have given me money, I wouldn't have to move in here. So as the audience, I'm like, oh, her parents have loot. But they don't. We learn pretty quickly, like they're working class people. From Scranton. Yeah. So... She's that girl, like entitled. She is very bossy with her boyfriend. And I think the casting of this role, oh, 
you know, I, I'm trying to figure out a way to say this that isn't bad, but like, it's just hard to watch like an unappealing person be like act so entitled and act like, of course this man wants to be with me and of course I can push him around. And it's like, honey, also she talks about her diet and her restrictions and it's like, you know, this late, this, what's this actor's name? Beanie Feltz. I mean, she's not a pretty thin lady, she, right? Well, we re reviewed films with her before. That's Jonah Hill's sister. I mean, she looks like she could be Jonah Hill's sister. Like, it, it's just watching this person play this character and be unlikable. It's a little too much. And I think you said it's based on a stage play. So I could see this working very well on stage in a more intimate environment where we don't have all the extra sensory stuff. But because this film is shot so well, because the apartment is such an effective character, just the her being so obnoxious and looking like that and acting like that and the like even Amy's character being sick and then we see her sitting on the toilet twice, we hear her talk about it a couple times and tells her mom like the, the bathroom stinks, don't go sorry about it. It's just like I can see it on stage how that would make sense. Sure. But I saw this bitch sitting on the toilet. I don't need to, like, hear about it. And <laughs> sure. I think that maybe some tweaks could have happened in the cinematic adaptation. Again, this is his first film, but... Uh, and then get, just finishing with Amy, it's like she see, It's just like she's too pitiful. Yeah. Because then it's also that actor... You know, Amy Schumer is... <laughs> like, she just looks pitiful. And then her character is, like, going through it. it I, it's a lot. I was surprised at how good I thought... What a good job I think Amy Schumer did in this role, though. Sure. Sure. And I, she didn't read like an attorney to me who is really like gunning for her career. But not that she couldn't be an attorney. It's just that like... She, she read me as somebody that's in a really bad spot right now at this point in her life. Uh, and I thought that the emotional notes all worked well for her. Um, I liked what they do do visually here is... Uh, everything's kind of medium length or even uh, long distance until they're kind of alone with themselves and their feelings and their secret desires that they aren't really sharing with people. Uh, so there are a lot of, uh, not a lot of, but frequent close-ups yeah. uh, of them. And like the, you intense know, close-ups. Momo, uh, like, like again, I feel like some of these plot points are a, a li like um, a little too concentrated, like Momo, grandma. There's a lot of mention of her and her illness and her having to take her medication, her knocked out on the couch, her escaping from the house at some point. Like, I mean, she moves pretty quickly because she made it down to the boiler room. And really, Momo's character's sort of pivotal moment is she sent an email to her daughter, the mom, Right before she knew, she knew that she was going senile or started early signs of dementia. So before she completely lost it, she wrote an email to, like to her family, and then the mom reads the email. And I thought that was a very beautiful, effective scene. Yes. And I felt like that's all I really needed from Momo. We see her getting wheeled in. It's not easy. We understand because the characters make it clear that she's a burden, but one that they accept responsibility for. And then. And then we read this email. I just didn't need all the shots of her laid out, her escaping the apartment. Sure. Like, overkill, that's the word. It, it does feel a little bit like overkill uh, with some of the depressing things these people are going through. Uh, but I also, uh, I think the best moment for Richard is he kind of gives, feeds us what the title is all about. As he talks about a comic book he read as a kid called Quasar about these monsters with teeth on their back. And these aliens these alien monsters tell each other horror stories about the humans and how really that's a metaphor for each each family member amongst themselves you know those are the humans but everything else outside is alien and monstrous but this is a film that exemplifies uh, like through tradition you know familial traditions and how eventually we grow apart and children think that they can supersede their parents in every way how these are just all monsters among themselves uh La uh, my final thought is, uh, while I think this story is great and there's a lot to talk about, it's not an enjoyable experience and I don't know when or whom people would want to congregate to watch this, but I do think the best way to watch this film is wait until next Thanksgiving when you're with family 
and recommend this film and just say, oh, it's a Thanksgiving movie, like you don't know anything about it, and put this shit on and just let everyone be uncomfortable for uh, two hours or however long it was. <laughs> uh, an hour 48. I'll be fine. But, but it, it is, but you know, the, por the performances overall I think are pretty good. Uh, it, it, yeah, it's not an enjoyable film as a comedy film or a horror film or a family drama. It's just one of those like classic stage dramas like Chekhov about life experience. What would you give it? I'd give it three and a half. I would five. give it three out of five. Anything else? No. Bye. Thank you.